What's up YouTube? This is Joe at True Life Investing. I got some great news for you today that's going to make a lot of people happy and put some more money into your pocket. So let's get right into it. From Monday night to today, the Democrats have settled on the income limits for which you can receive a full stimulus of the $1,400. So here are those limits. If you're an individual and you're making $75,000 or less, you're going to receive the full stimulus of $1,400. If you are head of household, if you're making $112,500 or less, you're going to receive the full uh, stimulus of $1,400. If you're a married couple making $150,000 or less, you're going to receive the full stimulus of $2,800. And let's not forget them little ones or any of them big ones too. If you have dependents, they are going to be receiving, you're going to be receiving $1,400 per dependent and there's no cap on that. So. As a person makes more money for individuals and for married couples, the same rule is going to apply that's been in place before. So for every $100 that you make over the limit, you're going to deduct $5 off of your stimulus check. And I'm going to actually put the link down in the description for you to go and see, uh, put in uh, your dependents and put in your income, whether you're single or married or head of household, and see how much money you're actually going to get when this stimulus passes in your bank account. So this is good news for those that were concerned about not being able to receive stimulus because they were going to change the limits from 75,000 for individuals max to 50,000 and then to change it for couples from $150,000 max to 100,000. And so this is something that the whenever they were going back and forth and they were debating about it, they were like, "Look, well, this is what we did before. We want to keep our word, we want to keep the same income limits and we want to take care of more Americans." But if you make over $200,000, you're not getting stimulus if you're a married couple. And this is just something that in there's a lot of case scenarios where previously in the previous packages, there was people that were making like $300,000 plus and they were getting stimulus checks. And so they're like, "Look, you know, if you're making $300,000 plus, you're not considered what we call, you know, those people that need relief." So that's where they're bringing in this cap of $200,000 and they're going to make sure that anybody above that, you're not getting no money and they want to, this is their form of making it more targeted in terms of who's actually getting the checks. Remember, you're talking about tens of millions of people that are going to be able to get these checks now because they didn't change the income limits. You're talking about over 90 million people are going to get these stimulus checks rather than the below 60 million people that would have been getting it if they would have changed the income limits. So this is something that if you wouldn't have been eligible for stimulus with the new income, income limits in place, these Democrats, they were like, look, there's a ton of people that need relief and we can't really measure out who needs relief or who doesn't really need, need relief. But if we follow what we've been doing, then we know for certain what the previous stimulus has already done for the economy. So that's where they want to keep it in place and keep moving forward with those income limits. So this is something where they're keeping a lot of people happy and they're bringing as much relief as possible to the economy and to American people. So it's good for the American people. You know, it's good for families. It's good for individuals to help them pay what they need to pay in terms of rent or bills or anything, you know, cars, uh, whatever they have to pay for in order to keep going and keep the economy going. So you got to remember that there's a ton of people that are coming up for re-election in two years. So they're going to be making sure that they make as many people happy as possible and they're taking care of their constituents so they can get those votes again so they can keep their jobs. So comment down below if this helps you out or if you think it should be more or what should it be? You know, they've done $1,400 stimulus checks. They did 600, you know, they did the previous 1200. What do you think it should be that would help people out, help, you know, the American people and help grow the economy? And don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel so we keep growing it and bringing you these awesome videos for you to watch and be entertained through. Now let's talk about minimum wage. I have to say, sorry guys, the $15 minimum wage is not making it into this American Rescue Relief Bill. They actually had an amendment, people went over it, they went back and forth and they decided not to include it in this relief bill. So there's gonna be more money that's gonna be allocated to other things instead of going to helping to raise the federal minimum wage. But that's not to say that they won't try to get it done. There are a lot of progressives who believe that the minimum wage should be $15 an hour and they're gonna be pushing for that very heavily. So if you think about it, 
that part of the bill is basically just being put on the back burner. But first, let's talk about it a little bit more because it's not just about the low wages that traps people in poverty, it's basically the utter lack of employment. In 2019, when unemployment was at a record low, 70% of poor adults did not work at all. A mere 10% of the American poor held down a full-time job for a year. Given that, 83% of those people living in poverty had no disabilities. A significant percentage of the non-workers are able-bodied and still do not work. Why does this perpetual non-working class exist? The poor face many barriers to work like lack of education, inadequate transportation, unaffordable childcare, or they can't get the licensing requirements to do the job that they want to do. They also battle a lot of disincentives to work because there's things such as like welfare pro programs that literally punish people for their, like they literally make a little bit more money, they get a slight increase in their job, and then all of a sudden their benefits that they're getting on welfare drastically cut down so it desensitizes de them to getting pay increase, to work more and to do more because they lose the benefits. Chronic unemployment is actually troubling because think about it like this, the only reliable path out of poverty is to work, is to make more money through your job. In 2019, the census found that 98% of full-time workers who worked year-round lived above the federal poverty level, regardless of their wage. For those working less than full-time a year-round, the percentage dropped to 88%. So that means that a mere 1% of American workers currently earn the minimum wage, of which nearly half of them are teenagers in entry-level jobs. Those who find and keep employment can expect a rising standard of living over time. You do a good job, you get pay increases. You do a good job, you get promoted. But in 2019, the real median income per person was at an all-time high of $36,000 compared to the average of $30,000 in the 1990s. But you gotta think about this. The employers that survive the increased cost of labor will have three options to choose from if they start raising the minimum wage to a point where it starts affecting the books, it starts affecting these, employ uh, these companies in terms of their cost and how they run the company. So those three options include automation, shift to skilled labor, price increases, None of these options bode well for the working poor. Companies that you already know are already pre uh, preparing for the probable coming so that they are preparing for this heavily in terms of changes within their company, in terms of automation and changing over who's doing what jobs and what's being carried out in order to be prepared for whenever this, you know, actually comes through this, you know, pay increase because there's so many people that are pushing for it it's most likely going to happen in this next coming years. But if you look at their plan, it's a multi-year phase in. So they're not going to go straight whenever they do pass this bill, which I expect them to pass it this year with everybody that's in the Senate and in the House, but it's a multi-year phase in. So this year it's going to be raised up from $7.25 to like $9, and then the next year it's $11, and then $12, $13, and then eventually by 2025 it'll be $15 per hour. But this gives large employers time to basically automate away many jobs. Amazon has already been doing this by adding a ton of robots to their warehouses. McDonald's has already been, uh, built their self-order kiosks. And then you think about big places like Walmart have already expanded self-checkout and they've already experimenting with self-stocking robots. So, I mean, in terms of these big companies see what's coming. They see the light down the road and they know that this is eventually going to get there and so they're trying to prepare so that their company can still be profitable so that they can still you know, take care of their shareholders and there's a lot of people that their jobs are being replaced by these machines. Where automation is not possible, there's a lot of employers that are shifting their business models from employing many low-skilled laborers to actually fewer and they're switching to more productive skill labors. This is exactly what happened when Seattle actually raised their minimum wage and they're phasing it in up to $15 an hour and this is what's happening. The hours that worked were in low wage jobs decreased by 9.4%. 
Even as high wage jobs expanded, researchers showed that the average low wage worker lost $125 a month in income due to the reduction in hours and 6.8% of them lost their jobs altogether. And this was literally happening during a citywide economic boom. There was a lot more high skill jobs that were increasing and then through the expanded you know, uh, wage in terms of the pay increase, those were lowering down. So when you think of this, there are so many different variables to consider when they're raising your minimum wage to a certain spot that's, you know, they're wanting to get it to $15 an hour. Well, that's basically double what it is right now. So let me know what you think in the comments. What do you think about them raising the minimum wage? What do you think what it should be? Because, you know, the federal thinks it should be at $15 an hour, but there's already so many states that have that are not at $7.25. There's literally a ton of them that are at nine, some even at 10 or 11. And so they're trying to make it across the board at 15. But what happens to those uh, jobs if you raise it to 15, then the other jobs that were already you know, close to 15, are they gonna get an equal amount of raise? And so, like I said, there's so much things to think about in terms of the economy, in terms of cost to the employer, in terms of rising costs. You know, if you go buy a burger, is it gonna go from being three, four dollars uh, a burger to like seven, eight dollars per burger? Because you gotta think about this, guys. Rich people are rich for a reason. They know how to stay rich. And they're gonna make sure that they keep lining their pockets and making their money. And so they're gonna figure out ways, whether they automate things or whether they hire uh, less workers to make sure that they're making their money. So there's got to be more than just, hey, we're going to raise it to 15, but there's got to be some stipulations. There's got to be some policies in place that make sure that workers can still keep their jobs, they can get help to be more skilled, and that they can overall grow in terms of their uh, skill as a job in order to make more money. So I just want to say thanks for watching this video. This is Joel with True Life Investing. Until next time, peace out.